If only I'd gotten vaccinated. I found out through my lawyer that the people who did that were the White House. If only. The CDC, uh, the Department of Homeland Security. If only. The Bureau of the Census with Twitter and Facebook. It's a tragedy. So if they didn't have a plan to do this, why would they have done that? Please don't let it become yours. Unless they wanted to sterilize millions of women. But do you still take into consideration that there might be an option that these people are deep down acting with the best intentions, but we just don't know what their goal is? It's not an option, I'm sorry. You can't escape the intentionality. I guess what I would say to you, and I feel sorry for you because you're at the point of like horror and disbelief and you know, Nietzsche, you know, when you stare into the abyss, the abyss stares back and I empathize, right? But we have to walk this journey together quickly because if Europe doesn't wake up, you will all be dead, right? Or your culture will be gone. It's a tragedy. Please don't let it become yours. American author and feminist Naomi Wolf became a prominent figure in the U.S. after publishing her first book, The Beauty Myth, in 1991, introducing a new terminology. Third wave feminism, third wave feminism, third wave feminism. Third wave feminism. There is nothing wrong with America that cannot be cured by what is right with America. She was a political advisor to the presidential campaigns of Bill Clinton and Al Gore and wrote bestsellers like The End of America, where she describes dying democracy's intense steps of fascism. And but then 2014, Naomi Wolf got a brand new image, a conspiracy theorist. She was heavily criticized and suspended in 2021 from Twitter, Facebook and YouTube for posting misinformation. Her latest book, Facing the Beast, was released in November 23 and now holds a Dutch translation. And well, she's here in the Netherlands in my studio for an interview about too many subjects to mention. So sit back, take your time and listen to one of the most controversial outspoken and courageous women of our time, Naomi Wolf. Wonderful having you here, Naomi. Um, for people who don't know you at all, tell me, who is Naomi Wolf? <laughs> well, I'm a mother of two beautiful children who are now adults and a stepmother of two wonderful young people. Um, and I've been a nonfiction writer for most of my career. I've written nine bestsellers. Um, and in 2016, I became co-founder of a tech company called dailyclout.io, uh, which makes it easier to engage with democracy and legislation. Um, and I guess the last thing people tend to be interested in knowing is that I was a political consultant for Clinton's re-election campaign in 96 and Vice President Gore's run for the presidency in 2000. Yeah, and you were also a strong advocate for feminism, huh? Correct. Wh why, why was it so important for you to address this? Great question. Well, to me, I've always cared about freedom. And to me, all of the issues uh, I've ever addressed, ranging from women's rights, um, cultural norms that are oppressive to women, which was the subject of my first book, The Beauty Myth, uh, all the way to my interest that began in 2007 with The End of America, with the subversion of democracy, which I predicted exactly what we're seeing now, sadly. Um, you know, all the way to my more recent books, uh, The Bodies of Others and Facing the Beast, which is the one that is now being published in Dutch. So thrilled about that, uh, which is about um, tyranny, outright tyranny th through m medical tyranny, right, through public mm. health. Um, all of those are the same fight. So to me, feminism is just extending that beautiful Enlightenment era um, realization that we all have inalienable rights derived from God, not derived from the state, um, and that we all uh, should be treated with equality under law, just extending that to women. And now you wrote your latest book, Facing the Beast. I'm going to hold it up so everyone can yeah, see it. I'm so excited about this book in Dutch. And now it's uh, in a Dutch translation, and we're also are going to uh, give away some books in the end of the program. Um, but what I would like to know is um, maybe a big question 
to start with, um, what kind of beast are we facing? What is the beast? That is a great question. Uh, so the beast, <laughs> multiple layers of answer, of course, because I'm a writer and we love metaphors. Um, the beast literally in that chapter of the book is a bear in our backyard. And the bear, I mean, we actually live in upstate New York in the woods, and there actually was You're a real me. bear. You're no, writing no. a book about a bear? <laughs> well, it's, it's a central it, metaphor. I thought it was about the devil. <laughs> also, also. But in one section of the book, there is this real bear in our backyard, and the bear has gotten inch by inch more and more comfortable in our backyard because we let it. We didn't make it unwelcome. And so then there's a day where I'm alone in the house and the bear is trying to get in and goes all the way around the house, various windows trying to get in. And I'm upstairs terrified. I grabbed a BB gun instead of a, a rifle because I'm not that uh, well-versed in weapons. And I was hiding in the bathroom calling the police. And they were like, called back when the bear breaks into the house and is coming up the steps because our police were defunded in the United States. But super scary. That was a metaphor for what I found out and presented in the rest of the essay, which is we've become so comfortable with our existential adversaries that they are trying to murder us. And that is also the beast. So the example in that chapter is that my independent research found that China, which organ harvests their own people, which puts their minorities in concentration camps, um, a flat out tyrannical Marxist society manufactures our pharmaceuticals, specifically manufactures the mRNA COVID injections that Western Europe and North America were mandated to inject into our bodies. And um, I found out very disturbing uh, outcomes, which I report in this book from our 3,250 doctors and scientists who volunteered to read through the Pfizer documents. So to me, and I'm skipping ahead a bit, the uh, control of these pharmaceuticals, their IP, intellectual property, their manufacture, their distribution. China opened 14 manufacturing plants in Western Europe and 11 in the United States to distribute this injection. That's a bioweapon because of the disability and death and sterilization that my team has documented in abundant detail from these primary sources. So that too is the beast that we have to face uh, and the last um, manifestation of the beast is, at the end of this book, I share my conclusion that the, the beast is in us because um, overnight in the COVID era, the pandemic era, people who believed in justice and inclusion and equality and were critical thinkers were fine with demonic behavior like literally satanic behavior, like brutal, cruel behavior systemically. They, in New York City, uh, they were fine with the overnight creation of a discrimination society, exactly like Jim Crow laws. That meant that I, as an unvaccinated person, could not enter a restaurant and eat with my family. They were fine with it. They were fine with masking children. They were fine with um, no science, science, and dicta. They, they were fine with people losing their jobs because they didn't want to take an experimental injection into their bodies. Um, they were fine with the splitting up of families, the ruining of friendships, the, the closing of uh, houses of worship. Um, so that's the beast. And I guess, lastly, this book concludes that we're not just in kind of a material struggle right now, against these forces, these tyrannical forces, we're also in a spiritual struggle. Yeah, because there is also a beast in the Bible. Interesting. But also a mark of the beast. Interesting. I wasn't, is... I wasn't thinking about that, but people have made that point. Please go ahead. Yeah, I, I did a wonderful interview with a, a pastor about that, uh, a priest about the mark of the beast. And he also has a, this interesting uh, analogy. What about does... What does he say about our current moment in that regard? Well, the mark of the beast is um, is a subject in the Bible where um, at one day everybody has to show a sign on his hand or somewhere else on his body right. to get access to food or uh, primarily uh, needs. Right. And that's when you actually obey the devil. Oh, wow. Uh, so the Bible writes about it. I'm getting chills. Uh, 
the, the similarities are amazing because, uh, of course, there are some people that have a chip in their hand to get access to money. And of course, it's, 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 it's simply technology, but it's moving in that direction. So there is also a biblical um, beast and a mark of the beast that, uh, that has some uh, significance in these times that right. uh, religious people call the end, end game. Times. Yeah. End times. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I, I also, I was actually very, uh, very touched by one of the first uh, pages of your book where you um, talked about this before world, mm. as you call it, yeah. uh, the before world. Because I, I remember that when COVID came across in 2020, uh, I was literally in a coma. I was not aware of anything mm. that was going on that you are describing for decades, mm. like in the end of America, mm -hmm. where you uh, described 10 steps of fascism. I was not aware of all these things. Right. Um, so when it, when it hit me, I was completely in a shock. Mm -hmm. So I had to kind of grieve and say goodbye to my before world. I was, I was, I was walking around here uh, close to the water and, uh, and crying because I was looking at a surreal world, right. in my opinion. Right. Uh, that doesn't exist anymore. Right. Uh, and I was, I was, I was wondering: Am I getting mad? Is this, is this, is it happening now? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I found it very touching to read about it that that you also describe before world, yeah. even though you are so much aware already about what was going on mm -hmm. in general. So, I, my question is: uh, Sorry for the long introduction. No, it's fine. Um, with all your knowledge and your consciousness, uh, you still mention a before world. Yeah. So there, for some reason, there, there must have been a pivotal moment for you also as well. Yeah, absolutely. What was that? Oh, that's a great question. Well, even though since 2012, I was aware of imminent, the threat of imminent fascism, right? In America or anywhere. I, I knew from my study of history, which thank God I did at that time, how easy it is to subvert a democracy. So people in America who, who believed it can never happen here were just deluding themselves, right? I mean, I knew the steps that like literally that what that book um, points out is that whether they're on the left or on the right, tyrants always take the same 10 steps and it always ends in martial law, emergency law. And often they use emergencies, you know, declare a state of emergency. Yeah. Uh, it can be a crisis of terrorism. It can be a crisis of public health. It can be a, you know, an environmental crisis. Uh, but you start with an emergency. So I was aware of that. But before 2020, I still had a fair amount of belief in the fundamental missions of institutions in the West. I still believe that most journalists were trying to tell the truth and that most hospitals were trying to heal people, right? That we were, our institutions were built, um, as I've put it elsewhere, on uh, this kind of Judeo-Christian foundation of healing and virtue, even, and the Ten Commandments, even though our secular societies have kind of elided the origins of those values, right? We're not supposed to say they're based on the Ten Commandments. Um, but I didn't realize till after 2020, the veil was pulled away. And I saw that overnight, and this is why I think there really is something, I don't think we're living in normal human history anymore as of 2020. I think we're living in some sort of post-human history, some sort of biblical or metaphysical history in which the laws of history have changed. Um, and I'll tell you why I think that. But Suddenly overnight, hospitals were no longer devoted to saving lives. They were administering remdesivir and the, the equivalent in Britain to hasten deaths. They were euthanizing people at, at industrial scale. Um, you know, in Canada, they introduced a suicide program and it, you know, it, it expanded and expanded. A suicide program? Oh, yeah. It's called MAID, M-A-I-D. It's a euthanasia program where you just call a number and the state comes and helps you kill yourself. Um, and it started with very elderly, terminally ill. And of course, as fascistic programs like this do, it's expanding and expanding. Now, if you're a depressed teenager, they'll they'll call you. At, someone who's vaccine injured called the hotline and to get help. And they said, oh, well, it's going to be very expensive for you to, uh, you know, live. Do you want us to come kill you? I'm, I'm not kidding. This is real. It doesn't probably... Uh, it's, it's, it's hardly 
possible for me to, to believe what you well, say because I mean, but it's that's so the, absurd. That's the time we're living yeah. in. Uh, yeah. You know, the algorithms of social media censor quite a lot country by country, yeah. which is why it's so great to be physically in another country. But you may not have heard of that, just no. like we don't hear about the freedom movement heroes and heroines like you and your colleagues in the Netherlands, in the United States. You know, I knew as a journalist from my own research that the BBC and the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, you know, and The Guardian were lying about many aspects of the pandemic. Uh, I knew from being a tech CEO that it was impossible that those giant maps on the front page of The New York Times that purported to show the surges in COVID and COVID infections and COVID deaths, I knew that the data couldn't be correct because there was no way to create an API, a, a, a funnel of data from 50 states that was identical in real time. And when I tried to look at the underlying data sets, I was prevented. The small print said, you can't see the data sets. So it's an imagine, like, if you can't see the data sets, you don't know it. it's real. The point is, overnight, all these institutions that were supposed to be based on truth and goodness got devoted to darkness and lies and, and murder. Um, so I, and this was happening at a scale and in uniformity that I'd never seen before in history. That's why I think we're in post, post-human history. In other words, in every time historically, even with the worst, monsters like Stalin or Hitler, right? There were dissidents, there was the right white rose group, there were partisans, there were people who wouldn't go along with it, you know, rich people who couldn't be bribed, there were factions. I mean, Hitler sustained assassination attempts, right? Never before have you had a situation in which pretty much every head of state in pretty much every country around the world read the same script and rolled out the same procedures and the same dicta in, in real time, step by step by step. Never before, and I didn't understand the role of AI, now I do in journalism, but never before was the same story being told in 200 languages around the world of don't hug grandma because you're gonna kill grandma, or don't go to Thanksgiving, don't go to Ramadan, don't go to Easter, right? Because you'll kill the people around you. Um, so I had to conclude that what we were seeing was beyond human capability and that the evil I saw was so magisterial and impressive, rolling out its machinations around the world in exactly simultaneous order. I had to conclude paradoxically that there must be a God that, that I, I started to believe in more literally than I had because this great evil, this impressive meta-human evil must be aimed at something. That's interesting. I had the same experience because I saw this this greatness of evil and I understood there must be the good as well. And probably it's God or something like that. Right. So I've, I've had this same kind of spiritual, religious uh, transition in my life that I still don't know exactly what it means. Right. Do you know what it means for you? I mean, do you believe in God now? Do you think he exists? Or are you just uh, as hopeless as I am, <laughs> hoping that there is something good to save us? Right. Well, I think the human condition is to be hope hopeless and hopeful at the same time when it comes to these questions. But, I mean, yes, I did always believe in God because I started my life as a weirdo, mystical child with... Um, with and I write about it in the book. I had uh, synesthesia as a child, which is like you see, you see colors as sound, you see numbers as color, multiple different ways of uh, sensory input coming in, and so I saw the world as illuminated by divine energy when I was a child. Like most kids who start out like that, I you know I had it kind of shamed out of me in school. So I lost that capability, but I always felt more at home with the William Blakes of the world or the Walt Whitmans who see everything illuminated by, you know, this divine fire. Um, but I didn't talk about it because one of the weird things about our time is intellectuals are not supposed to have a spiritual life. It makes them not credible, which is insane. The intellectuals before the World War II were allowed to talk about God. They wondered about God. They were deeply, uh, deeply invested in learning about God um, in many cultures. 
So that believing something was there wasn't new to me, but in the pandemic, and especially with the work of the Pfizer documents volunteers, which was like opening the gates of Bergen-Belsen, right? It was like one report after another showing that Pfizer knew, meaning the FDA knew, meaning the CDC knew, meaning the White House knew, the president knew that these injections were killing people, disabling people, sterilizing people, murdering people, injuring the hearts of children, um, and that, that the knowledge that they would do so went back 10 years, right? You truly think that this is done deliberately? I, I, will, I will restate, because I know it's a big concept. I'm, there is no other conclusion to reach from having read the 96 reports my volunteers have created based on the primary source documentation in the Pfizer documents. Pfizer knew from one month after rollout of the injections that they didn't work to stop COVID. The third most common side effect is COVID in the Pfizer documents. And the internal Pfizer documents conclude vaccine failure and failure of efficacy. Pfizer knew that um, lipid nanoparticles have been known for 10 years to uh, degrade both male and female uh, reproductive capacity. The Pfizer documents, it's a respiratory infection, you know, arguably, right? But there's nothing about lungs and breathing in the Pfizer documents, like literally nothing. It's all about sex and reproduction. And so in the Pfizer documents, they keep charts of how many tens of thousands of women they know they ruined their menstrual cycles in horrific ways. Like these women bleed every day. These women lost their cycles altogether and have no, you know, they can't have children. These women, you know- You found can, records of that. Oh, abundant, abundant records. You know, they knew that um, in April of 2021, the White House knew and we FOIA'd these emails that the injections were injuring the hearts of minors, myocarditis and pericarditis. And instead of coming forward and telling everyone and stopping the, the mandates, they, created a crisis communications meeting with all of the most senior people on the chain, including the president, president's um, staff. And they covered it up with a script that is 17 pages fully redacted. And they told us it was safe and effective and to inject our minors for the whole rest of that year. But who, who in the world would want that? Why? Well, that's an important question. I, I have the answer. I mean, I presented in the book. Um, I mean, I could, I just want to say I could go on and on with my evidence that, of course, they knew. They knew since, well, they knew since 2020 that they were sterilizing and injuring and murdering people at industrial scale and causing neurological events and blood clots and lung clots and heart damage and all the things we're seeing, you know, people dropping dead in their sleep. We know the mechanisms now. They knew they were, the lipid nanoparticles traverse the placenta and we, there's a million missing babies in Western Europe now and a drop in live births of 13 to 20% in North America and Western Europe. Missing babies? What do you mean by that? They weren't born. They, they, the, there's a drop in live births. Yeah. Um, there's a section of the Pfizer documents that shows an over 80% spontaneous abortion or miscarriage rate in the pregnant women in the study. Um, they knew that babies nursing from vaccinated moms, breast milk were going into convulsions and having fevers and vomiting and one baby died. And there's a chart of the babies, the sick babies. There's just a chart. They just, like Mengele, they just record the deaths. They record the injuries. There were two babies who died in utero and Pfizer concluded it was due to maternal exposure to the vaccine. And this report went to the CDC on April 20th, 2021. Three days later, Dr. Walensky, our head of the CDC at that point, gave a White House press conference telling the women of America that the vaccine was safe to use in pregnancy, that there was no bad time to take the vaccine before your pregnancy, during your pregnancy, or after your child was born. And she had this report in her hand showing that it was murdering babies in, in utero. So they knew. Why would they do it? Did Joe Biden know? Yeah. Yeah. The template to surface the cover-up of myocarditis went to his office, to his chief of staff. And in December 2021, he gave a press conference, one of the many, about uh, taking the COVID shot. And he also uh, predicted a terrible future for the people who were not willing to cooperate. That's right. My message to unvaccinated Americans is this. 
What more is there to wait for? What more do you need to see? We've made vaccinations free, safe and convenient. The vaccine is FDA approval. Over 200 million Americans have gotten at least one shot. We've been patient, but our patience is wearing thin. And your refusal has cost all of us. So please do the right thing. But just don't take it from me. Listen to the voices of unvaccinated Americans who are lying in hospital beds, taking their final breath, saying, if only I'd gotten vaccinated. If only. It's a tragedy. Please don't let it become yours. Joe Biden. Are we facing the beast here? Totally. He knew he was lying. But he has children. I mean, I doubt very much they took this injection. Um, but how can people like him live with themselves? How can they look in the mirror and move on if they know? Right. What, what kind of people are they? I mean, you have history of people like that. Think about all the people who went along with Nazi Germany, all the people who, even in occupied countries, who went along in order not to get singled out, not to have professional repercussions. Um, we know the mechanisms now. I've traced them in my last book, The Bodies of Others, and in this book. Uh, our president is captured by this cabal, basically, of the World Health Organization, the World Economic Forum, China, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Can you explain cabal for people who don't know this? Phenomenon? Sure, I'm so sorry. Um, a, a, an alliance of evildoers, a kind of um, meta-national Secret society alliance. or? I mean, it's not that secret. They, you know, they, they put their plans out there. I mean, Carl, Carl Schwab wrote a book about this time. You know, the World Health Organization has a treaty that's been widely covered that will drain sovereignty of our nation states so in, in fact, May. So in a kind of a cartel. A cartel is a better term. Uh, uh, it's a... It's, it's not um, a cabal. It, it's, a, it's an alliance of people with bad motivations who are structuring their actions in coordination with each other. And you are suffering it here in Europe as well because your public health officials from the United Kingdom to the Netherlands to France to Germany took their orders from the World Health Organization, took their scripts from the World Health Organization. Um, your doctors are being expected to uh, repeat uh, falsehoods about safe and effective injections and not tell their patients what the dangers are. And when their patients come to them with vaccine injuries, they're not even allowed to say this is likely to be a vaccine injury. So we know the mechanism whereby that's happened, which is millions of dollars went to professional organizations that license physicians in the United States and probably in Europe as well. And they delicensed doctors who dared to warn their patients. Uh, so I guess what I'm trying to say is at the very top, you have to sell your soul to Satan or in the case of the Biden family, take $3 million from a Chinese government asset which is what the Hunter Biden laptop shows, right? And I voted for that administration, so I'm thoroughly unbiased in my criticism. Um, and then down the chain, people get bribed or threatened. And we see it all the way down to local public health officials, local, local police. I mean, the police in New York City, when I tried to sit in a, an area cordoned off for the vaccinated in Grand Central Station, I was surrounded by cops. They didn't want to keep me from making use of a public bench. You know, they certainly didn't want to when I pointed out the history of keeping people from sitting down in public places in the United States, our Jim Crow laws. Um, but they were bound by the governor. You know, they were bound by the police commissioner. So... It's, it's rippling down. It's that rippling is, down. But do you still um, take into consideration that there might be an option that these people are deep down acting with the best intentions, but we just don't know what their goal is. Oh, I see. You mean the people who are organizing yeah. it? Yeah. No, I gave... Is that still an option? It's not an option. I'm sorry. And if you read Facing the Beast, you'll 
unfortunately reached the same conclusion I did. So I mentioned that China got hold of the manufacturing process. So those are the people, you know, China, the World Health Organization, it's not your, your officials, your government officials in your parliament. It's not even the EU. Over the EU is the World Health Organization, and, and they're using China as a cat's paw. And the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, right? They're, they're the ones who funded Pfizer, fund, you know, who has contracts with the Netherlands and the United States and Argentina and countries around the world, right? Did you find out what their end goal is? I can what? tell you what their end goal is. I can tell you exactly what their end goal is. So in the Pfizer documents, it shows 46,000 adverse events in three months. And of those, 36,000 are in the United States. The next tranche, and you'll appreciate this, the next sec, uh, group of adverse events is in Western Europe, in order of political importance of the country. So Germany, France, Britain, Italy, Spain, Greece, right? Proportionately down the line. And then all the rest of the world combined, 52 countries, add up to only 7,000 adverse events. Now, it's very easy to make this injection more or less lethal or disabling based on very simple things like brand, with Moderna more than three times more toxic than Pfizer, for instance. I don't know about AstraZeneca or what you're using in the Netherlands. And even things like storage and temperature, because on, with warmer temperatures, it, it uh, thickens. And with body temperature, it thickens, right? So it creates blood clots. So my point is, look at what's happening. You're getting um, classes of people injured or drop, dropping dead. You're getting 50 Austrian mayors in the peak of health in their 50s dropping dead. You get 65 um, doctors in Canada dropping dead. You get athletes and comedians, leaders, right, actors uh, dropping dead. You get the royal family, cancer, 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 right, of Britain. So, and, and then compare that with and a million people in the United States a month, according to Ed Dowd, the BlackRock hedge fund manager, former BlackRock hedge fund manager, who's tabulating government databases and insurance databases, a, a million people are identifying as disabled every month in, in the United States. So at the same time, our southern border in the United States is open, and the State Department, my independent research found this to be true, is funding with the UN this mass immigration from- There's a lot of evidence for that, yeah. So much yeah. evidence. Uh, and, and it's 16.5 million people now just walked over the border. They're being airlifted. They're being flown to strategic locations around the United States. They're being housed in barracks type accommodation, which never happened to immigrants before in my country. And the same thing is happening in Europe. It looks a little different, but and it's been going on longer, but millions of people coming. No, no disrespect. I'm the daughter of immigrants and the granddaughter of immigrants, but these people are being, are being flown in from China Uzbekistan, um, Afghanistan, uh, uh, Angola, places that export mercenaries, as well as Venezuela, uh, cartel, you know, gang members, whole cartels. Um, and you look at the footage, my husband's a, a veteran and a, a former member of military intelligence, and he, he's identified that the, pe the, the groups coming in look like soldiers, train like soldiers, walk like soldiers, stand like soldiers, have military haircuts, they're, they're fighting age men overwhelmingly, and they're being stationed at strategic locations throughout the United States in large groups. What is that? This is a staging area, it's an invasion, right? At one signal, these you saw the mayhem with the October 7th in Israel with a small group of terrorists crossing the border. At one signal, you could have so much chaos that the elections have to be suspended. That's the, the plan, or martial law declared. Same thing is happening here. But even if you just leave it, right, even if these are thoroughly peaceful newcomers, um, as, as Ed Dowd said so rightly, just wait five years and you'll have a completely different America and a completely different Western Europe. And in America, but why? Because well, I'll get there. Well, <laughs> in America, the people who are injected will die off or be too weak to fight, and the people who've taken their places don't come from countries that have a history of human rights or representative democracy. And the same thing is true in Western Europe. And so I'll tell you the why. And this is the same why that goes back to the end of America. Western Europe and like Europeans need to wake up to the value of their own culture and their own history. 
and this is not a racist thing to say, it is just purely, you know, what Western Europe developed doesn't make you better than anyone else, but it, there are precious things in your culture that you have to like realize in time, you have to save and defend and fight for. And the same thing with the United States, because it's only the United States and Western Europe that are the last obstacles to this globalist plan to create a feudal society around the world and, and uh, to turn us into like nodes in a central bank digital currency, you know, vaccine passport, thoroughly tracked, surveilled um, uh, suppression society. And only our Constitution and our Second Amendment, our First and Second Amendments, our Fourth Amendment, and only your vestigial, you know, laws protecting human rights, laws protecting freedom of assembly and freedom of speech, and only your tradition of the individual and individual rights um, is going, it stands in the way of that. So if you just poison Western Europe and North America, wait for us to die, make us too weak to fight, there's... I haven't talked about the effect on masculinity of some of these toxins, including the food supply, but weaken the men, fragment the families, right? Uh, destroy churches and synagogues so people no longer have communities in which to worship. Take away the guns, which they're trying to do in the United States. Then, and then station millions of people from around the world throughout these cultures that have no relationship to this culture, to this tradition. You have a replacement workforce that is easy to subjugate. That's the why. The thing is, um, I, I see the same patterns, but it's so hard to, to prove it. Mm, I proved it. I mean, the data are incontrovertible. The, what's in these injections, we found it. We, we linked to the primary source internal documentation. The numbers over the border. Oh, I don't disagree it? with yeah. the data and with the results. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, we also in our other shows like Black Box Today, we reported about this immigration um, at the Mexican border of the U.S. and by 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 the aid of several organizations, the UN. Right. Yeah. So these are facts are. that you're bringing in. Um, I find it so difficult to truly believe that there is this evil intention behind right. it. Right. Maybe because I don't want to believe it. Right. Um, but you seem to, to know it. Well, I would like to conclude otherwise, but the trail of the, I'm an investigative reporter, right? At a certain point when you're looking at a crime scene and there's a bunch of dead bodies on the floor and there's a, a weapon, you know, you have to conclude that someone killed all those people, I, you know, with, in, with intention. Um, I, can't escape what I know about the intentionality of this because so many people, the FDA waved it right through. Like I was deplatformed in June of 2021 for an accurate tweet, accurately noting that women were reporting menstrual symptoms. That's a, a, a primary piece of evidence, a, you know, a woman's eyewitness report of her own body, right? And it's, it's the kind of reporting I've been doing for 35 years that made me world famous and beloved, you know, reporting on women's health and women's sexual health. Later on, it became mainstream news as well, totally. because you were right totally. with that. Point is, when you're asking about intentionality, that early, not only was I deplatformed, but there was this global smear campaign against my reputation. I found out through my lawyer recently that the pe people who did that were the White House, the CDC, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, the Bureau of the Census, with Twitter and Facebook um, on, the, uh, on the CC. They were leaning on Twitter and Facebook with my little tweet that could have saved millions of women's health and lives and millions of babies. Um, and they were saying, we have to put out a bolo, meaning be on the lookout for material like this. And then my, my career was upended. I became a non-person. I couldn't publish anymore. You know, I was called crazy. And every news outlet that had published me for 35 years, um, that was the White House. That was my White House. So if they didn't have a plan to do this, why would they have done that in 2021? Why smear someone who's calling attention to something that would sterilize millions of women unless they wanted to sterilize millions of women, right? It was the White House. So you can't escape the intentionality. 
I guess what I would say to you, and I feel sorry for you because you're at the point of like horror and disbelief and, you know, Nietzsche, you know, when you stare into the abyss, the abyss stares back and I empathize, right? But we have to walk this journey together quickly because if Europe doesn't wake up, you will all be dead, right? Or your culture will be gone and, and you'll all be very ill, you know, like it's now that we have to have this existential crisis of facing the fact that, yes, this evil was this big, Lots of people at the top went along with it and knew it. They justified it. Others went along with it out of fear. And the last thing I will say about this, and then I will pause, I promise, is I wrote an essay in which to, I noted that many leaders in the freedom movement who noticed what was going on early come from cultures that have been genocided in their history. Many are African American. Many are Jewish. Many are Irish. The Irish were systematically, you know, genocided and starved by the, you know, colonial British to depopulate them in exactly the same way. We're being depopulated. Um, and many are Southeast Asian. And, and in India, again, col you know, colonial powers uh, controlled them in very systematic ways and very cruel ways. So people who have, and Armenians are also in the health freedom movement. So people who whose ancestors were genocided, I guess what I'm trying to say is the weird thing about history, right, is you think your own time is normal. So if you've never been in a walled city where they, you know, rolled in a gift that looks like a Trojan horse and then, oh my God, it turns out there are soldiers inside that gift, you would never think that could happen, right? And if you were never a Native American who received blankets that had smallpox in them, which really happened, right? You would never think that would happen. And if your ancestors were never turned into soap, you know, in places not so far away from here, you would never think human beings would do that, right? In every generation, we need to learn anew that this, these things can happen. And so I guess I just want to say, like, please wake up, because not only is this genocidal impulse alive and well and active since 2020, they have new technologies to scale it around the world, digital and pharmaceutical technologies. Are you, in fact, saying that the Nazis never lost the war and they just, in Europe, tried to build this federal state, European Union, after all? Totally. And that's one of the beasts that we have to face? I, I absolutely believe so. And I think they're kind of geniuses because they're very patient. And they built a post-war Europe that looked so good for so long that everyone relaxed while all of their rights of representation and resistance were taken bit by bit by bit. And, and still there are so many people that think that you're mad. Mm, that, no. <laughs> that we are mad. Oh, because, are I mean, mad, I'm... Right. I'm on the same page with you. I just don't know so much as you seem mm -hmm. to know because you studied it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm interviewing you here to hear what you have to say. Mm -hmm. um, but there are so many people around that think that what you're saying is totally nuts. Well, <laughs> I mean, respectfully, I think that we're encouraged. As I, as I met, so I, I have a tech company and I know how algorithms work, right? So people, when they look at their device and they're online, if they don't know how algorithms work, they think they're seeing what everyone else is seeing. But you're really only seeing what the algorithm wants to show you. So I am telling you that here in this studio in the Netherlands, I'm sure you feel quite alone often. And I'm sure that many people around you say you're crazy and believe what the bought off media is telling them and the state media, of course. But around the world, you are not alone. And in country after country that I've visited, there is a resistance movement in which people have figured out what's happening. Um, so you're part of a very, I would say, almost a plurality. I would say in the United States, 50% of people know what you know. And I'm sure throughout Europe, 20 to 30% in every country know what you know. And that's all it takes to, you know, to win a revolution, ultimately. Um, if people are willing to be a little bit courageous. Uh, but I, I guess I would also say that if people, something very bad, and again, I think demonic, has happened cognitively since 2020, which is people who are supposed to be critical thinkers stopped being willing to look at primary source evidence if it went against the narrative. Um, And that's happened over and over. Some of that is probably now due to brain damage from the injection because it crosses the blood-brain barrier. And pe people have noticed more binary thinking 
in vaccinated people. There's a really good book uh, by Dr. Michael Nels called The Indoctrinated Brain that talks about brain damage from the injections. But in a way, I don't have any patience for people who call me crazy or call you crazy without looking at the evidence. And I kind of, life is short and we're in a real emergency, like literally the future of humanity, let alone the future of Europe and the Netherlands and the United States, hangs in the balance. And if people are going to call me a conspiracy theory or call you crazy and not look at our source material, they're not engaging in real thought or real journalism and um, they're just being dumb and they won't survive. But there is a conspiracy going on. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, so, there is. So maybe we are conspiracy theorists. Yeah, I mean, I have my We're thoughts just... about that phrase. I, I mean, I guess what I would say is most people haven't been in the rooms where presidents and vice presidents are making decisions or their staff is. And I have. And you were it, at Bill Clinton and Al Gore. I, I was uh, Bill Clinton's campaign advisor and I was Al Gore's advisor. So you work with him? Yeah, yeah. In person? Yeah. Yeah. Point is, it's only in closed rooms, away from a paper trail, away from a press release, away from any documentation, that important decisions are made. And so the idea of a conspiracy theory being a bad thing, I think it was uh, actually Mark Crispin Miller, the NYU professor, has shown that the CIA coined that phrase. It used to be called critical thinking or investigative journalism or a hypothesis, right? So. Um, there are many conspiracies. I mean, Pfizer conspired to get the emergency use authorization finally by hiding eight vaccinated people's deaths and not telling the FDA so they could get the authorization. Um, I mean, there are conspiracies all around us. What's a conspiracy? It's just a group of powerful people acting behind the scenes in concert for an outcome. And that's literally how power works. It's how power has always worked. So I think people have to stop being naive and because that disempowers them. And you know, when you start to ask questions these days, you're called a conspiracy theorist, whereas 10 years ago, you were called a, you know, a citizen <laughs> or yeah. a journalist. There is somebody that you um, know, Naomi Klein. I don't know her personally. Well, you know her name. You know the fact that she exists and that she writes about you. She wrote a book, Doppelganger. Yeah. And she was interviewed. And um, the two of you get mixed up Sometimes I heard not in, ever, not not in my life, maybe oh, in her life. She, she seems to have a problem with it. Yeah. Um, and she um, was interviewed about uh, her new book, uh, Doppelganger, and she also tried to give a definition about uh, what a conspiracy theorist is. Let's watch. The subtitle of the book is A Trip into the Mirror World. Mm -hmm. Briefly define for our viewers, what is the mirror world? Yeah, so I was really struck when I, uh, so the book is not about Wolf, I want to say. Yes, it sure. really uses her as a case study for these people who have dramatically changed. I think it would be shocking for some of your viewers who knew her in her beauty myth days or as an advisor to Al Gore yes. to know that she does not just appear on Steve Bannon's show. I mean, she's, she plays the role almost of, as, of a co-host. There are periods where she is on every single day they co-wrote a book together what? filled with vaccine misinformation. They put out T-shirts wow. together. I, I mean, it is, it is the weirdest buddy movie that you could possibly imagine. I call these folks not conspiracy theorists, but conspiracy influencers. That's good. There is not a theory. It contradicts itself all the time. That's One good. minute COVID's a bioweapon, the next minute it's a cold. They never try to resolve yes. the two. Okay. Uh, very good points. Yeah, that's Naomi Klein talking about her new book and about conspiracy theorists being conspiracy influencers, in fact. Um, she said that people like you, like me, have dramatically changed. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that sense, she's actually disqualifying the fact that there is this before world and mm -hmm. after world. It's us that have been changed. Right. Well, so there is this perception yeah. that is completely different from our perception. How can it possibly be that this woman is um, seeing the world with these different right, eyes? Right. Um, I can tell you. <laughs> shall, I, shall I respond to that? Yeah. Well, first, so interesting. I tried to avoid her book, I haven't read it, and her attacks on me because I have an important mission, which is saving lives right yeah. now and saving, you know, helping to save our democracies. Um, I can't be 
distracted by nonsense. But that's a really interesting clip. I hadn't seen it because she tells two whopping lies. I never wrote a book with Steve Bannon and I never made t-shirts with Steve Bannon. So she's supposed to be a credible investigative reporter and she just made two huge factual errors on national television. Um, number so this one. is disinformation. Total. It's, a, it's, it's not just disinformation. It's a falsehood. You know, I mean, it's a, a legally actionable falsehood. Um, secondly, I mean, I respect Steve Bannon for giving me a platform and I, I never swallowed the Kool-Aid on the left that you have to agree with people that you talk to. I like talking to people with whom I disagree because I learn things. But, um, but that was just a, a whopping set of whopping lies. Um, the other thing people should know about Naomi Klein before I credit her as actually having any uh, sincere intentions in her book is that um, I thoroughly debunked Naomi Klein. It turns out that her husband is a spokesmodel for pharma in a, 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 a lobbying effort called PharmaCare in Canada, which would take pharma out of the vulnerability of being in the free market and give it one gigantic check every year courtesy of the Canadian government, um, of massive amounts of Canadian tax dollars. That's her husband, so that money flows right into the family. And her father-in-law sits on the board of a nonprofit whose uh, mission is to get vaccines into countries in the developing world, and they got a $10 million grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So you're saying she's biased? Totally. Or, or journalistically, it's journalistic ethics to disclose those conflicts of interest right before you write a book-length attack full of falsehoods on someone who threatens pharma profits. Yeah. Could it be that she thinks that she's on the right side of history? I mean, you, you know, it's so interesting. I'm very moved by the Netherlands because you're such good people. You, you can't bring yourselves to think that some people really are just bad, because <laughs> this is a question that's come up a lot. I think that people who tried to keep black children out of white schools really sincerely believed they were doing the right thing. And I think that a lot of people who are chopping off minors' genitals and giving them, you know, hormones to change their gender identity think they're doing the right thing. And I think that a lot of people who, you know, confiscated the wealth of my, you know, German for their former father-in-law's family um, thought they were doing the right thing. And uh, I very often people, what is that phrase? You, you know, you can't persuade a man that something is wrong if that's his paycheck, right? I think if her family and her father-in-law and her husband are taking that much money from pharma, she is likely to organically believe that Pharma can't possibly lie to you because if she had to face the fact that pharma can lie and injure and murder and maim, she would have some painful changes to make in her own household. So people are very good at lying to themselves. They're very good at being in denial. Um, but for a journalist, you know, like that's, you also have to look at the timing, right? Here's a woman at the top of her career, a very respected intellectual. She's written fantastic books, No Logo and Shock Doctrine. And the whole COVID bonanza is the perfect example of the kind of shock doctrine she identified in which a crisis is exploited by corporate interests, right, for money. Um, and instead of criticizing this huge uh, attack on our civil liberties and, and profit, profiteering from a stated crisis, she spends two years at the peak of her career writing a book about me a fellow intellectual who's never done anything to her and trying to smear me and discredit me um, right before or as we were rolling out our um, critiques of, uh, of Big Pharma and of these injections. And her husband was given his job, you know, shilling for pharma the same year. It all was, was being pushed hard um, after I was already active critiquing uh, big Pharma. In fact, my critique of Big Pharma went back to 2019 in my book Outrages, which identified the cholera and typhus epidemic in the 1840s in Britain as the first opportunity for the state to invade people's privacy and to control the commons. And you may notice that my, my reputation has really been under attack since 2019. So yeah. you make your own uh, conclusions, but journalistically, she should have sat down and said, Mehdi Hassan, I've got to disclose. My family takes a lot of money from pharmaceutical interests and 
My subject, Naomi Wolf, is critical of pharma and driving down their profits, full disclosure. Uh, in your book, you also um, spend some pages on forgiving people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> it goes on. You, you forgave so many people who did uh, terrible things to you uh, on a personal level. Uh, but then there comes this passage where you are not so forgiving to certain people uh, who to you are the perpetrators. Um, the thing is, for me, it's hard to distinguish who is the victim and who is the perpetrator because almost everybody who got involved in this whole COVID hoax or situation mm -hmm. uh, had to save his own properties or his job or mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. his reputation. Mm -hmm. So it kind of got mixed up who is the victim and who right. is the perpetrator. Right. How can we ever come to justice? Right. I mean, this is the same struggle that took place in Germany after World War II, you know, in the Nuremberg trials. Um, denazification. It took place in East Germany. It took place in Rwanda. You know, truth and reconciliation committees. But in any savagely fascist regime, which is what you and I are both living in, quite more quietly in the Netherlands and Europe, more openly in the United States, um, the collaborators are out in public and, you know, mostly think they're good people just holding on to their jobs, right? Or they rationalize, like if, if I wasn't doing this, someone without my scruples would be here doing it. Um, so I, I do believe that no, like there's this big push in the United States now for amnesty, COVID amnesty, right? Oh, we didn't know what we were doing. They knew, like if I knew, they knew. The information was public. But we can't have that, right? We can't just sweep it under the rug and move on, which is the cliche in the U.S., because there has to be accountability, especially How? for public the tribunals. Well, it's so I think that the rule of law, respectfully, has been very degraded in the Netherlands because of the EU structure. So people can't imagine, imagine civil and criminal trials at the national level for civil and criminal wrongdoing. Um, but you need the courts. And, uh, and you need legislation. I don't know how easy it is to pass legislation anymore at the national level, but you need laws passed that say these perpetrators who did these things during this period in history have to be tried in a court of law, and um, until they're tried, they can't continue in their current roles. Uh, and there need to be investigations at the you know, most senior level. You need civil and criminal trials. You need individuals to bring civil and criminal cases. We raise money in the U.S. to sue Pfizer. We've sued the Biden administration. We've sued, I have a lawsuit against Twitter. Um, people need to, you know, hire lawyers. They need to hire lawyers for what the schools did to the kids when they masked them. Uh, they need to hire lawyers for losing loved ones or loved ones dying alone. There are civil um, remedies for those wrongs and criminal remedies for uh, battery and trafficking. And um, I mean, basically our nation was held hostage, and so was yours during the pandemic. Um, so I don't know the law, I'm not a lawyer in the Netherlands, but all of the things that happened to us, suppression of business, right? Those are criminal offenses. Um, and then there has to be accountability, there has to be cultural accountability. Uh, my husband talks about making perpetrators unwelcome in your community. I think that's completely legitimate. Let them be hounded out of the Netherlands. Let them be hounded out of the United States. Let them go from community to community with people knowing what they did. You know, they colluded in killing people. They colluded in suffocating our children for no reason behind masks. They colluded in discriminating, right? You can vote with your pocketbook. Um, I never want to support another restaurant or gym or theater that... Uh, I mean, the, the, the movie theater in my town in Millerton wouldn't let me in because I'm unvaccinated. I'm never going to go to another movie in that movie theater. I'm never going to recommend it to anyone. It's powerful to, you know, to boycott businesses that um, colluded. It's, it's powerful to out them, out them on social media. There's got to be disclosure. And the last thing I will say is that I kind of have lost patience for all of all Quislings. I've lost patience. I would rather 
work as a waitress for the rest of my life than participate in the murder of anyone and, or as a journalist participate in lies. I would rather clean floors for the rest of my life. And so when hi, I get emails, and I've got a chapter of this book, I get emails all the time from people saying, you're so brave. Of course, I would come forward and do what you're doing, but I have you know, the nonsensical reason. My boss would be mad at me. And they are upper middle class, college educated, graduate school educated people who would not die. You know, they would lose their jobs. Big, big deal. You know, you'd lose your job at the Pasteur Institute. You know who you are. You know, you'd lose your job at the Cleveland Clinic. You know, big deal. Look at the dissident doctors in the United States. They told the truth. They refused to collude with murder. They lost their jobs. They're fighting horrible legal battles. You know, they, they, our lives are so difficult, right? I lost a six-figure investment in my company. You know, I, I, am a, I can never publish in the legacy media again. I, I don't exist in the legacy media. I can never publish another book with Random House or Simon & Schuster. You know, you're, you're, all your news outlets who used to cover me, cover my books here in the Netherlands, crickets, silence, right? They, no one wanted to talk to me, right? I mean, non-person, too bad, right? Too bad. I've saved millions of lives and these dissident doctors have too. And you've suffered. You, your life went up, turned upside down, but you refused to go along with it. So I guess I would just say, knowing the history of fascism, people are kidding themselves if they think, oh, I'll just stay silent and then it will be okay. Because if you stay silent, it will not be okay. They will come for you anyway. If they want your property, they'll come for you. If they want your kids, they'll come for you. You know, if they want your business, they'll come for you. If they don't like your ethnic minority or your ethnic majority, they'll come for you, right? If you lose your democracy and your rule of law. So the history of fascism shows that being silent is the most dangerous thing. You know, you may lose your job now, like you and I did. You may lose your comfortable life. You may lose a lot of friends like you and I did. But someday you're going to die and you're going to face God. I do believe that. And you're going to be accountable for your choices. And you will be asked in this time, did you go along with this great evil, which killed so many people, which led people to die alone, which, which broke the spirits of children? And you'll need to account for yourself, you know? And so for that reason, I want to be on the right side of history as uncomfortable and financially punishing as it is. Um, and also just practically, in the Netherlands, I see the change. You know, I see that people are subdued here. And they used to, it used to be a vibrant free society the last time I was here. People know there's a shadow over them. And that shadow, you guys have been here before. You know, that shadow is not going away. If you try to comply it away, it's just going to get worse. You talked about facing the beast regarding to what happened to us during COVID. But in your book, you also said that the attack on human society is not over yet. There's more to come. Yeah. You mentioned GMO mosquitoes. You mentioned disruption on the supply chain. You, you, you mentioned power blackouts, um, all sorts of things like food safety decline, the, the WHO treaty that will take over our sovereignty. I mean, the worst is yet to come if I if, if, if I understand right. Well, again, it depends on us, right? The worst attacks are yet to come, but we've been pretty successful in the United States in about half the country fighting back against the evildoers. So their plans have not come to fruition. We're gonna keep trying to thwart them. Like there's a big movement to stop this uh, funding, US funding of the WHO. And there's a, a bill and it's just one example. But I guess what I want to say is we have to face the fact that a handful of sociopaths tried to kill us all or sterilize us, and they're not going to stop trying, right? So, and they're not going to stop trying to get total control. So I do see, just coming to the Netherlands, I see their agenda even more advanced here than in the United States. For example, we are fighting against facial recognition, because all that is data harvested to create a hologram of everyone, basically, and then um, complete social credit control. And at the airport, I saw Europeans just walking through the facial recognition, walking through. They just accepted it. They accepted it, even though it's voluntary. You, you have the right to protest it and not go through that way. Um, it, it's not true they delete the data. That's nonsense. I'm a tech CEO. They don't delete the data. They sell it to third parties. Um, and it'll be used to track you. Um, 
I, I see this, the heating issues that people are having, the high cost of heat. That's not an accident. That's not the war in Ukraine. That's intentional. Um, they, there's a, you know, I, I watch videos from the UK where they talk about how, you know, using air fryers to save on utility bills and being cold, you know, like Europeans, Western Europeans were never cold, let alone hungry, you know, and I see the attacks on the food supply. I see the Dutch farmers protesting the, the effort to restrict agriculture, right? All the things I predicted have come true in Western Europe as well as in North America. Um, so I guess what I would like is for the Netherlands to understand these attacks are not going to stop. They'll always be cloaked in things like a housing crisis or an energy crisis, but they're going to try to make you um, censored, broke, and hungry, and cold, so that, and, and replaced by other people, so that you will go quietly. And, and it's up to us to resist. And we can, we can, but we have to recognize what we're dealing with. This whole period in your life during COVID made you a more spiritual person, where you saw bad and good, the beast, and maybe something like God. Um, don't you think that by shining so much light on the dark, we are feeding the monster? That's Is that a, good, a possibility? It's a good question, but... Shouldn't we shine more light on the good things, on what we want, what we want to achieve? I get that criticism quite often yeah, these you're, days you're a, you're from people that watch my yeah. shows because yeah. uh, obviously this story is not <laughs> right. doesn't sound like <laughs> something to feel happy about and right. and it also doesn't sound like a happy end so how should we deal with this dark message well i think if you ha so it's actually a riveting time in the united states because the liberty movement is gaining a lot of traction, building new institutions, building new media, building new um, telemedicine companies. Uh, like that's what's happening, right? Spiritually and politically, the old institutions are dying or losing all credibility and new institutions that are based on ethical precepts are being built to take their place. Um, so that's positive. But I guess I would say that what we're called to do right now is a spiritual challenge, right? So I do believe, I believe you are shining a light because you're interviewing people who are trying to save lives and they're trying to save democracy and they're trying to save the rule of law and they're trying to save history, right? They're trying to save medicine and science. They're trying to keep the darkness from descending. So that that is the light. But also I do firmly believe, look, this is my belief. I'm not proselytizing. My religion forbids me to proselytize anyway. But my humble belief from having looked deeply into this moment, deeply into history and also deeply into the New Testament and the Old Testament, is that this has happened before, more in the Hebrew Bible than in the Christian Gospels. But there are times when God is like, I'm, you know what, do it yourself, see what that's like. Like, I'll withdraw, you guys party on and see how that feels. You know, follow, you want to follow your own path, you want to worship idols, I'll just step back. Let's watch what happens. That's where we are right now. So I, I firmly believe that when people recognize the, the, the darkness that we've been led into and we allowed ourselves to participate in by not loving our neighbor as ourselves, right? By worshiping medicine, worshiping science, worshiping status, worshiping our mortgages, right? Not protecting our children, not protecting our elders. God stepped back. And if we want God to save us, which I think is the only way we're going to get out of this, right? Like one man with God is an army, right? Or one woman with God. The fundamental test is whose side are you going to stand on, life or death? Whose side will you choose, you know, darkness, malevolent, demonic forces or some spiritual blessing that created this whole universe and gave us, like, look at all the things that have been targeted in the last few years. Families, the face, children's bodies, um, you know, community, touch, intimacy, uh, food, right? Worship, singing, dancing, theater, like all the things that make us human, which connect us to the divine, right? So I think this is like a wake-up call, like 
I gave you your body. You know, I gave you the ability to father and mother children. I gave you families. I gave you the earth that yields fruit all the time and sun and, you know, all these blessings. Are you going to appreciate them and act accordingly and like walk with me in some ethical way? Or are you just going to go to the dark side in which, in which case like we kind of don't deserve all these things we were given in my view? So, that, so I think that that's the moment we're in where we're each called to really make a decision. And I guess to me, my life is very hard, right, day to day. And I'm scared all the time. Like my, you know, my husband was detained at the airport and like, uh, you know, he's my bodyguard. Like I met him because of death threats. He, he wasn't detained for a bad reason. But my point is like every time I go through an airport, I'm scared because um, there are not laws protecting dissidents in other countries the way there are in the United States. If I wasn't married to my bodyguard, I'd be even more scared than I am. You know, I'm training with weapons, right? Because we're in a war, right? I, not for an aggressive reason, but in case, God forbid, anyone ever tries to, you know, take over our house or whatever. Where, where I'm going is, we're in a war. Please wake up. It's, there's a war in Europe as well as in the United States. It's just quieter, but it's breaking the spirit of Europeans and separating them from their history. In, you know, the next step is Europe will be just a gigantic parking lot with, you know, an ankle monitor on every citizen or the metaphorical digital equivalent. And I guess fighting every day for the right thing and for our families and for our bodies, real medicine, real journalism, it is the light, right? And it brings down like 3,500 volunteers and a tiny woman named Amy Kelly, my COO, stopped Pfizer, that one of the greatest companies in the world, largest, brought booster uptake to 4% and drove their profits down to pre-2016 levels. A handful of people That's dedicated to humanity. Right, but it's not our achievement. Like if you witness some of how things are unfolding now, it's obvious that God is helping these tiny bands of people who are doing the right thing. And you may not believe in God, but it's obvious that like a higher power than we have the ability to do ourselves is helping us, right? I mean, I was completely silenced by big tech and my and the largest you know government on earth, superpower government. And my voice is louder than it was before I was silenced. That's not me. That's not because I'm super smart or whatever. It's because I think you know, I think God wants to save us and he wants the information to get out. He wants us to wake up. He wants us to save ourselves. And I, I'm not saying I'm special. I'm just saying when you align with God's will, it's my experience, you get help that goes beyond what you think you can do by yourself. And the Old Testament is full of that too. Like, you know, people saying, I can't get the children of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, I can't even speak well. And God's saying, Ugh, I made you, I know who you are, you know, like, I'll help you. It's over and over in our history. Um, it happens like that. We're facing, or the story of Esther, same thing, genocidal moment. You know, all of the Jews were going to be slaughtered the next day. And she decided not to go along. You know, she knew she might be murdered by her husband. And she fasted and prayed and went to see King Ahasuerus and said, my people are about to be murdered. And you know, she saved her people, right? But she had to risk herself to do that. So many examples. And I mean, I was taught so many examples of Dutch citizens who sheltered, you know, my people in World War II. And You're they, Jewish. Huh? I'm Jewish. Yeah. And they put themselves at risk and they did the right thing and they loved their neighbors themselves. And I mean, if they lived, if they died, I believe they would still you know, have kind of eternal life because they did the right thing. And so that's the moment that we're at. Like, how do you want to spend eternity, I think, is the moment that we're at, you know. And I think that's beautiful. I mean, in a way, it's beautiful. If people kind of wake up in time, this could be an incredible mass awakening. And I'm not talking about, like, one religion or another religion, just like, we're here for a reason. Let's love each other. These are not normal times. Yeah. Yeah. Let's have some fun. Totally. I have some questions for you. Okay. And the only thing you can answer is yes or no. All right. <laughs> All right. So we can end this interview with some uh, laughter, maybe. Okay. And it's about the fact that people like us are considered to be 
conspiracy theorists. So let's put it on the test. Okay. So I have a set of questions for you. And as I said, the only answer you can give is yes or no. Okay. So let's start. The earth is flat and it's not a ball. No. <laughs> no. The World Economic Forum is ruling the West. In a manner of speaking. I can only say yes or no? Yes or no. All right, yes. 9-11 was an inside job by the US government. Well, if something's not proven, do I have to say no? Like, <laughs> all right, this is very reductive. Uh, no, it was not. Chemtrails are spread to make us weak and sick. I reject the term chemtrail because everything is chemistry, but I, I, I can't say yes or no to that because it's an open question. I'm not sure it's to make us weak or sick. I think it has more to do with um, geopolitics and, okay. yeah. The moon landing was a fake film production. No. We are ruled by reptilians. No. We're living a life in a simulation. No. Nord Stream was blown up by the US. Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> the Ukraine-Russia war is a proxy war led by the US. All wars are proxy wars. But sure, yes, yes. The Ukraine-Russia war is an attempt to weaken Europe and to keep the U.S. in power. No, it's an attempt to bankrupt the U.S. The CBDC is an attempt to enslave all citizens in the world by the elites. Yes, of course. Climate change is a hoax. No, I don't know what's causing the climate change, but it's not a hoax. Yeah. Joe Biden is a puppet of the deep state. Yes. <laughs> Joe Biden is dead. And what we see is a clone. Uh, no knowledge of that. I'm going to say no to that one. Bill Gates is just a bored billionaire with only one last wish to rule the world. Um, yeah. Yeah. The WHO and the United Nations are committing an attempt to take over control over all countries that will sign the pandemic treaty. Yeah, that's not a conspiracy theory. It's in the treaty. Yes. Event 201 wasn't a random tabletop rehearsal, but a brutal alibi and a middle finger to the world how powerful elites are. I'm going to say no because it, it was a planning session. Yeah. This is fun. The elites are planning a new pandemic soon called Disease X. So they say that's a yes. Millions of courageous and sincere people led by God are planning a coup on the power that be to win back humanity and to live a free, fearless and a healthy life ever after. I don't know. I, I can't say yes or no to that. I think it's a I wish question. you would have said yes. I don't think led by God, right? Because I think if there is an awakening and people take back their lives and their governments, it'll be because they recognize God within themselves. Are you still hopeful? Yeah, I am. Why? Because I meet people like you and your colleagues and everywhere I go, I meet people who are not going along with it. It's, it, you know, look at history. It took a tiny handful to resist the greatest tyrants in the world and eventually they crumbled. But it's up to us. Again, it's up to the people watching. It's not just up to you. Like people watching have to not say, well, he's doing it or she's doing it. They have to do it in their own neighborhoods and face, you know, not being invited to the play date. <laughs> Your book is now translated in Dutch. Yes, I'm so excited. Yeah, and we are giving away three books um, after a quiz that we're introducing now. And you have an interesting question for people to answer. And you yes. can send the answer by email to the address in the description. And what is your question? The question is, what is the name of our beloved dog whose death is recounted in Facing the Beast? I know the name because I read your book. I advise you to do so. So if you're interested in the book, you can buy it, of course. Uh, also, information about it, you can find it in the description. But if you want to win a book, just give the answer, the right answer by mail. Naomi, thanks a lot for being here and being so open about these incredibly difficult, difficult. terrible subjects that it's, for me, still hard to comprehend what you just said. Uh, so I have to digest it, and I think also the audience has to do that. Uh, but uh, I admire your bravery, and I hope yeah. that, um, yeah, things will get right with your career again, and maybe you can 
<laughs> live a normal life again like uh, you used to do. Well, that'll be lovely. I mean, things are fine with my career because as you know, the alternative media is thriving and legacy media is dying. Um, but I appreciate your kind words and I would love for life to be normal again, but hopefully better than it was. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just create a new world. A new world. A better That's world. A better world. Yeah. Lechaim to that. Yeah. But Indeed. first we have to face the beast as she said in the book. Thanks for watching. If you uh, want to support us, um, we are independent. We have no government support, no sponsors, no investors. So only donations is why we're doing what we're doing. So if you can help us with a little bit of money, uh, we appreciate that because that's how we work and how we can do these interviews with people like you. So thanks, Naomi. Have a safe trip Thank back you. to the US. Thank and so thanks much. for having you. Thanks so much and thanks for doing what you do.